Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Glad you're with us this morning. I'm Pastor Jeff. Welcome to Estes Brook. Uh, a couple of announcements this morning. Um, prayer before the service every morning, 9.45 to 10.15. We do not have a staffed nursery today. Literally all of our nursery attendants are either homesick or home with sick children. So we do not have a staff nursery. The nursery is still available if anyone needs to go down there with your kids. Um, but we don't have it staffed this morning. Apologize for that, but can't be helped. Um, we do have children's church today, however. So right before the service, uh, the sermon, uh, we will be dismissing kids downstairs for children's church. I know um, uh, the uh, children's church folks are excited about that today. Um, there is small group after the service today. Um, uh, it is after the service, not at 5 o'clock. They're going to have it immediately after the service today. Uh, also today, if you got one, um, the ladies' survey, um, those are due today. There's a basket on the back table that says, like, women's survey to put that in there. If, if for some reason you didn't get a copy, um, you can, like, you can attack Jim and be like, I didn't get one. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there's extra copies in the back, though. You can grab and just fill one out. It's pretty short. It's only a couple of blanks to fill out. Um, but please try to get that done today. Um, they're going to, uh, the, the, um, the congregational care team is trying to um, put together some teams based off of people's willingness to serve in different capacities. Uh, the other, um, uh, we have Priscilla Circle this week at 1.30 on Tuesday. Um, and I believe, and, and Sybil is actually here this morning, so I can verify this. Sybil, it's at your house this time, correct? So it's at Sybil's house. If you don't know where Sybil's house is, you can ask Sybil, and she's here, and she can tell you. And th Welcome back, Sybil. Good to see you. Um, and the other kind of major announcement, and we're going to continue to talk about this for, for weeks to come, um, we need to uh, put together a centennial celebration team. This is our centennial as a church. We want to um, do some things to celebrate that. We want to put together a team of people to um, help coordinate an event for that. Uh, if you are interested in being a part of that team, you can talk to myself or any of the elders right now because of, due to sickness and travel, um, the elders that are here today are myself and Jim, so you can ask either, um, talk to either one of us about it or reach out to any of the, um, to any of the other elders. Um, uh, that is something that we definitely want um, to put a team together for, to plan that. Um, and we want to get that going as quickly as possible here. So if you're interested in that, please talk to us as soon as possible. I um, there's a couple other announcements in the bulletin I ask you to check out. I think that's our ma main announcements for, um, right now. So we're going to pray and uh, um, continue to worship the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before you today and worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you that you are a God who, though you do not live in houses built by human hands, you are here with us this morning because you say wherever two or more gather in your name, you are there in the midst of them. And through your spirit, you are present with us always. So help us to feel your presence here today, Lord, and to meet with you as we give you the praise and honor and glory that you and you alone are due. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Thank you. Please stand and we will worship with with music. Our first song will be Send the Light. There's a call coming ring or the restless wench. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from door to door. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the message and the call today. Send the Send the light, send the light, send the light, the 
children right now from age three to fifth grade uh, who would like to, uh, and parents are okay with it, are dismissed downstairs for Children's Church. Um, that's down in room five. There's signs all the way downstairs. Sorry, I literally just ran upstairs from downstairs. So we are, uh, um, and after the, after the sermon is over and we're doing songs, if they're done, they'll come back upstairs. If they're not back up by the time we're done with the service, then parents go down and pick them up. So like literally I ran upstairs just now. So we are uh, continuing in our sermon series. Not that I'm out of shape. I, I promise that's not what this is. <laughs> pear is a shape. I've been told pear is a shape. So um, we are continuing in our sermon series in the book of Acts. And we're in Acts 17 today. And we're going to be actually doing something a little bit different. Um, for one thing, we're going to be talking about Paul's time in Athens and we're going to take this over a course of two weeks because it is a lot of content. Um, and I wanted to do something with us, um, with everyone today, to get a real sense for the things that Paul was dealing with when he ministered in Athens. The story of Paul in Athens in the book of Acts is um, considered by a lot of people kind of a template for how do we minister in a modern world. And we're going to see today that some of the things that Paul was dealing with in Athens are things that we deal with all the time. And, and there is something that we can learn from how does Paul respond to those things as maybe a good template for how we ought to respond to the world around us. So as a quick reminder, Acts... Again, i kind of been saying this every week, but just to kind of keep us on top of this. Acts is really about the story of Jesus continuing his ministry, his work through the Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit active in the early church, the apostles and others. And it's about them bringing the good news of Jesus from where they were, Jerusalem, to their surrounding communities, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Um, what we've seen recently is Paul and his traveling companions, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, they've come to Macedonia, uh, which is on the European continent, to share the gospel. And they've had kind of some resistance to the gospel in Philippi and Thessalonica and then Berea, though it didn't really come from Berea. Thessalonican Jews followed Paul to Berea to, um, to show opposition. And that actually caused Paul to need to leave maybe somewhat prematurely, um, at least according to his own plans, and make his way down to Athens. Um, so we're going to pray and we're going to dive into God's word for us today. And like I said, we're going to um, do a couple of things that are slightly different than what we normally do um, as we talk about Paul's time in Athens. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would show us the truth of your word 
and how you want us to respond and minister to the world around us that, that at times can see not, seem in opposition to you, but at times seem to be actually kind of open to some things and how to meet people where they're at. Help us to have the same kind of heart and response that your, your servant Paul had and how we interact with people that do not belong to you currently, that do not know you, I should say, but need you so desperately. We pray that you would speak clearly to us today and give us ears to hear. We ask this in Jesus' name. So at the end of our last text, we're told that Paul goes to Athens. And if you recall, he's, he's alone. Actually, Luke was probably with him. But um, he doesn't have his normal Silas and um, Timothy aren't with him. He's kind of, kind of ministering on his own a little bit more. Um, and he gets to the city of Athens. And Athens is a, an, interesting, um, an interesting city in a lot of ways. First of all, Athens is not in Macedonia. It's actually officially in Achaia or the Greek, um, what would have been called ancient Greece. Um, Macedonia was a northern region, still a Roman, both Roman territories at the time. But in Paul's day, the population of Athens was only around 10,000 people, which is actually relatively small. Actually, it was smaller than some of the other cities he's already, um, he's already been to. The reason why it was smaller is because in 146 BC, um, Athens had been kind of the seat of power for the, Greco uh, the, the Greek Empire, and the Romans came and conquered it in 146, and they decimated the city. Um, they, they really... Uh, they slaughtered a lot of people, and then they took a lot of people out of the city to kind of gut Greece of its power. And even now, um, the, the writing, you know, the, the time that Paul is visiting here, it is, it's over 200 years after that, and it still hasn't really rebounded. Um, its population is only about 10,000 people. However, it was still considered the cultural and intellectual center of the Roman Empire. Even though Rome was, on, you know, was in what we would call modern-day Italy, by the way, modern-day Italy is relatively new. Modern-day Italy is only a little over 100 years old, if you don't know that. Um, until the late 1800s, Italy was not a country, um, not the way we know it today. Um, but the, the Roman Empire was obviously, when you'd be like, well, it was centered in Rome. Yes, their political power and their military might was in Rome. But actually, the Romans adopted so much of Greek culture and history and, and even their religion that the cultural and intellectual center of the Roman Empire was still Athens, Greece. And so this, this relatively comparatively small town was considered kind of the, the cultural center of the world. Um, and that's, by the way, that's, that's not uncommon, right? Um, what is the capital of the United States? Washington, D.C., is it the cultural center of the United States? No, it is not. Um, you know, even though we, we've got a lot of museums and that kind of stuff there, it's still not the cultural center of the United States. You could argue like New York is or, or Los Angeles, and you might be like, that's, those, I don't know about that. Well, that's, but it's still, that's, you know, they have more cultural influence than, than Washington, D.C. does. Athens was world-renowned for its magnificent art and architecture. It was known around the world for its, like, you'd walk through the city in beautiful art everywhere you went on public display. However, the way this art was uh, designed, it was, portray um, the art portrayed the various gods and goddesses of the Greek pantheon, the Greek system of, of religion. So anytime you saw art anywhere, it was probably some scene from Greek mythology. Um, or it was a statue uh, uh, to, of one of the Greek gods or goddesses. Overwhelmingly, that's what you saw. And most of the impressive buildings were actually temples to these pagan gods, to these Greek gods. So, yes, they're known for art and for architecture, but as Paul points out, it's all based in religion. This is still true today. So I did a little, just a little Google search when I was um, doing sermon prep this week, and I just looked up um, places to visit in Athens, Greece. 
and it gave me a list of here's the 15 places you've got to go in Athens. And I looked at like five different websites, and all of them, uh, of the 15, nine of them were the same on all of them, and the other six were varied a little bit. But at least nine of those 15 on every list were historical landmarks. And what I mean by that are places like this. Probably the most famous building in Athens is the Parthenon. It was constructed between 40, 447 and 436 BC as a temple to the city's namesake, the goddess Athena. Athens is named after the Greek goddess of wisdom, Athena. Um, and it was built in her honor. It originally had a statue of Athena about 35 feet tall up on a pillar in the middle of this. And it was an open, it had a roof on it, but it was, the columns on the side were open so you could come in and worship anytime you wanted. It is the, literally the center of the city. Everything else about the city is built around this temple. This is called the um, Erechtheion. It was built around 430 BC as a temple to Poseidon and Athena. Almost everything in there is to whatever god and Athena, because it's her city. Um, huge. You can see, I don't know if you can make this out, but there's these pillar, uh, these beautiful statues of these, these maidens here. These are virgin maidens of Athena. Um, still stands today. So when I say, like, I'm giving you dates and showing you quick pictures here, because this, is all, this stuff was all built hundreds of years before Paul got there, and they were kept up. Them falling into the disrepair they're in now, that didn't happen until literally it became more of a Christian country and they stopped keeping them up. But during Paul's day, these would have been magnificent and glorious and just awe-inspiring. This is the Temple of Olympian Zeus. Constructed between, uh, construction began in the 6th century BC and lasted almost 600 years to complete this. This is one of those like, okay, well, yeah, temples, we get it, but they probably had other public spaces. Yes, there was this beautiful amphitheater. This is the Theater of Dionysus. It was built in the late 6th century, and it acted as an amphitheater for music and plays, but it was also a temple to the Greek god of wine, Dionysus. By the way, the Romans had versions of all of these gods and goddesses. They had different names for them, but Bacchus is the, you know, that. Um, and some of them have the same names and some of them don't. But um, this is the temple of Athena Nike, built around 420 BC to Athena, the goddess of wisdom, and Nike, the goddess of victory. Now you might be like, well, I didn't know we were getting uh, an architectural lesson today. I wanted to show you that before we even get into the text today, because if you go to Athens today, you find the remnants of all of this stuff. And this is literally almost 2,000 years after the writing of the book of Acts, after Paul was there. So imagine all of that stuff in its glory and heyday is the backdrop to which Paul walks into the city of Athens. It is unlike any city he has ever been to. In most cities... You would go someplace and you'd be like, oh yeah, you've got you know, businesses and you've got you know, uh, a shipping district or whatever. You've got, and you, maybe you've got some temples in a little section. And you walk through Athens and they're literally permeating everywhere you go. You can't go anywhere and not see temples. And, and this is what we, we find. Now while Paul was waiting for them, that is Silas and Timothy, in Athens... His spirit was provoked with him and within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Idols meaning statues or images to other gods. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So Paul gets to Athens, like I said, just very different. And, and he's kind of on his own, or him and Luke are walking around the city. And, and he looks around, and he saw what we would see today, but in all of its glory and with a whole lot more temples. He saw a city that was built around worshiping these gods. Religion was the language of Athens. And it was permeated the culture and in, in, in just in everything. Like, you couldn't... Um, literally everywhere, he go, everywhere you go, it's dedicated to some Greek god. 
And his response um, in the original language here, and some translations show this better than others, is actually he gets angry. He has a righteous anger. He's like, what? This is, this is not okay. It says, um, the ESV says his spirit was provoked within him. That is kind of, uh, it's kind of a euphemism for saying that he was, he was stirred up to anger in his spirit. His response is, this isn't okay. He saw the glory and worship that was due only to the Lord being given to countless others. So many that he can't count, he says later. And he's angry about it. Righteously, he, he's... And, and let me de- describe just briefly, there's a lot to cover today, but just briefly, let me describe what the difference between anger and righteous anger is. Anger is um, our, our emotional response when things don't go our way. Human anger is, is driven by hurt feelings and often jealousy and other things. Somebody does something to you and you don't like it, you get angry. It's a very human response. Righteous anger is when you get angry, not because you have been wronged, but because someone else has been, and you see injustice, and it motivates you. He says, this is not right. When Jesus turns over the temple, or the tables in the temple, that is righteous anger. He's not, his, his concern has little to, and nothing really to do with him. It's how others are being treated in that setting, his father and other worshipers. Likewise, Paul's anger here isn't like, they're, not, they're making fun of me or something. No, every other town he's been to, they have come at Paul hard. And not once have you heard that Paul got angry. But here he sees how God is being, uh, the glory that's due to God is not being given to him. And he's jealous for God. He's like, this isn't right. And he, it makes him angry. Now, to be clear, this isn't, um, this is, this is not an uncommon occurrence. We've run into this in Acts already. In fact, this was probably the reaction of some of the Jews that opposed Paul's preaching about Christ. They probably saw Paul preaching about this Jesus as you're trying to take glory from God alone. And, and Jesus is like, no, no, no. He's, and Paul's like, he, Jesus is God. Like, I'm, it, he's not. And, and they wouldn't have seen it that way, and so they would have probably been angry. In fact, the first time we really see this in the book of Acts is actually Saul, that is Paul, himself acting this way. When he sees Christians preaching about Jesus, his early reaction to the apostles' preaching was exactly this. He motivates the people with righteous anger, and what does he motivate them to? Violence. We're told in Acts 8, 1, Saul oversees the, the martyrdom, the murder of Stephen for preaching Christ. We're told in Acts 9, 1 and 2, he's on his way to Damascus to cause violence among the church there. He's not doing it because he's a jerk. He's doing it because he's motivated by what he sees as righteous anger. These people are preaching something other than the truth. We got to stop them. However, this isn't the same Saul. In fact, he doesn't even go by that name anymore. This isn't the same response that you see, the reaction that you see of of violence that that Paul's experience as he's preaching Christ, or he even had in his early days before he knew Christ, is now something different. Rather than provoking Paul to violence, he responds completely differently. And that is maybe the first thing we got to take out of this. It's a distinction between reaction and response. Reaction is how we feel or how we act without thinking. It's knee-jerk. If I throw a ball at your head, you're going to probably do one of a couple things if you have any kind of reaction time. You're going to try to catch it, or you're going to try to dodge it, right? You probably aren't going to just sit there and let it hit you in the face, unless you want to get hit in the face. That's reaction. A lot of times we respond or we react in anger when something doesn't go our way. 
Response is different. Response is thoughtful, prayerful. It's us thinking through and praying through a situation and then asking God, what do you want me to do about this? It's different. What Paul has run into in, since he's been on the continent is a lot of violent reaction to him preaching Christ. And it, it would seem to us that maybe it would have been maybe completely appropriate that, that Paul would have been like, this is outrageous. We can't, you're worshiping these idols and going to temples and start knocking stuff over and that kind of thing. Like, uh, yeah, that would have been fine. No, it wouldn't have. Why? Because no, that would have shut down all conversation. We're going to see, in a, in, actually, in a couple months when we get to Paul in Ephesus, how riots break out because of idolatry there. And it doesn't have anything to do with Paul destroying idols. Not in a physical way, at least. So his response, rather than violence, is he saw by all of this idolatry, all of these people worshiping these false gods, he saw a need. So the first thing he does is he, br he brought the gospel to the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, which is what he did in every other city, right? He goes to the Jews first. And he may have even used this idolatry that, that was so rampant in the city, which the Jews would have not liked either, and he would have probably, you know, maybe brought up, like, hey, I'm, I'm concerned for the, God's glory here, the Lord's glory, um, and, and maybe put their mind at ease about that, kind of quelled their fears. Like, I'm not here to do that when I talk to you about Jesus. We're on the same page. We have this common concern. But then he does something that he has not done yet, at least not in, in Europe, in, um, in Macedonia and Achaia. He starts spending his time not just talking to the people that already have a, a, a foundation of faith and, a, and some understanding of what the Messiah is and the God of the Bible. He starts going into the marketplace on a daily basis. Um, the word that's used there is the agora, is actually the, the term for it. And I, and I put that word there just to explain this. You'll often read um, in, in Scripture, depending on your translation, or um, you'll even hear sometimes about the agora of ideas. It's a, it's a term sometimes used in certain circles. Agora means a marketplace. But it's not just a marketplace for goods. It's also a marketplace where ideas are shared. And that was especially true in Athens. So he goes into the, kind of the middle of the marketplace. He, he sets up shop. We actually find out later on he was a tent maker. So he might have even been selling stuff there. We don't know this at that point in time. Um, definitely was true later. But he's also, it says, he is sharing Jesus with whoever happened to be there and would listen to him. He actually did something that I think is another lesson for us. He directed his mission on those who he saw most in need. Instead of looking at all of the idolatry and saying, I can't believe this, I'm so angry, this is so wrong, Arr! he said, it just shows me how broken and in need of Jesus these people are. So I've got to bring Jesus to them. They're not going to come to me. They're not coming to the synagogue. I'm going to go to where they are. And he starts talking about Jesus very openly in this setting to Gentiles, to, to, to non-Jews that don't, know probably anything about the God of the Bible. And then we're told some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? And others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So because Paul put himself in a different setting, the marketplace, he had a new audience. People were willing to listen to what Paul had to say, and this willingness to go where people gathered gave him a new audience, which is not only a Gentile audience in general, but specifically philosophers. Because remember, the Agora was a marketplace of goods and ideas, which means philosophers would also gather there and kind of talk about stuff and, you know, talk about kind of what are the latest thoughts and that kind of thing. And um, while, the, while some of them stripe up conversations with, with Paul, 
One group of these is described as Epicureans. And I'm going to describe these people to you, both of these groups, kind of in detail, and you might say, we don't need to know. Actually, we do. Because you're going to see that these two groups still fully exist and we interact with them daily in the world. Epicureans were materialists. That means that they believed in, in the goodness and, and um, trueness of real things. Uh, they believed that all human existence only came from particles of matter. Actually, they kind of coined the modern term atom. Now, what I mean for, by that is, they said, listen, we are made up of stuff. And this is all we are, is just stuff. We live in a real world surrounded by real things. The spiritual isn't really that big of a concern for us. Um, to them, human existence ended with death. When you die, you're dead. That's it. So talking about the idea of resurrection to them would be ludicrous. They'd be like, resurrection? Wait, you die and then you, you'll be dead for a while, but then your immortal soul comes back. Oh, that's cute. That's nice. We don't believe in that garbage. When you're dead, you're warm food. It's over. That's what they believed. They believed that the gods existed, but they believed they were pretty much disinterested, disinterested spectators to human life. Yeah, they, they live up in Olympus. Sure they do. They don't care about us, though. They might watch us, but they probably just laugh at us. They're not interested in us. Why would they be? They're made of different things. Nothing to do with us. And they believed, and I'm going to share something with you about this in a second. They believe that the greatest good in life is to seek modest pleasures to attain a state of tranquility, freedom from fear, and absence from bodily pain. In other words, have a comfortable life. Try not to go through too much hardship. You might say, okay, well, I don't know what that has to do with us today. They would say things like, we're all made of stardust. That's a quote by Carl Sagan, by the way, who's dead now, but very prominent scientist and, and public figure in Western culture. Died just a few years ago. This description of Epicureanism um, though it agrees wholeheartedly with everything that I read from commentaries and everything else, is actually off of the Epicurean Society of America's website. This is a prominent way of thinking. Whether you call it Epicureanism or not, we probably all know people that are like, listen, I'm a secular humanist. I'm agnostic. I don't really believe in a God. Maybe, maybe... Um, uh, maybe I'm atheistic, which means I don't believe in a God at all, agnostic. There's pro there might be a God, but I don't, we can't know about him, and he doesn't care about us. And all that matters is the life that we have, and, all that, um, and we find our meaning by what we make of it. This is a prominent way of thinking in our world. People might not call themselves Epicureans, but that is, probably describes a large chunk of of non-Christians that we run into on a daily basis. This is alive and well. Which means that how Paul interacts with them in that setting can tell us volumes about how do we interact with people that think the same way in our settings. The other group are Stoics. I actually have to admit something here. Um, we have changed the meaning of the word Stoic. Stoic now, if you say someone is stoic, it means that they're passionless. It means that they, uh, they're just they're devoid of emotion. Actually, that's not what stoic philosophy was at all. Stoics were materialists also, but they're pantheists. Literally, pantheism is the belief that everything is God. It was a belief that the divine was to be found in all of nature, including human beings. A spark of the divine exists in everything. We are all part of God. And God is all part of us. The trees, the ground, the earth, everything. God is in it, and he's in all of us. They had a strong sense of fate, that 
that our, our, our destinies are not necessarily chosen by us, but instead that divine that goes through all of us is somehow working that all out. By the way, I'm not trying to convince you that this is true. I'm just telling you what they believed. They, be, they also believed that there was periodic world-ending events after which history repeated itself. When I say world-ending, universe-ending would be a better way of saying it. Cataclysmic events that on occasion would wipe out everything and it would start all over at like a reset button. And, and uh, they would say, yeah, everything would get, you know, what's happened will happen again. It's happened before, you know. And we'll be there for it in some capacity, but we won't remember because we're just, you know, we're all, we're all part of that divine they do believe in the, the soul's immortali um, immortality, but they couldn't conceive of resurrection, not the way that, that Scripture teaches it, because they didn't believe, though they believed in some idea of the immortality of the soul, which they actually borrowed from Plato, they didn't believe in the personality of the soul, the personalness. They believed that we would still exist in some kind of energy form, but we wouldn't be us anymore. We would lose all sense of ourselves. So the idea that we get a new body and we're going to be back kind of to something close to what we used to be, that was like that, no, that doesn't make any sense to them. And they would say that humans realized their fullest potential when they lived by reason. And the word they used for it was the Greek word logos or logos. Now you might not know a whole lot of Greek from the Bible, but you probably recognize that word if you've read anything. It's the word that's used to describe Jesus in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, the logos. Now, they didn't mean the same thing by it that John did, but that's the word they used. We borrowed their word, not the other way around. They th saw this as the divine principle which held everything together. And again, you might be saying, yeah, but that's, what, who cares? Do you know anybody that believes anything close to this? I have a sister who believes something that if I were to describe this to her, she'd be like, yes. That sounds pretty, we're all one with nature. And we're just, we just kind of keep getting recycled. This is actually very close to actually Buddhist belief. Um, it, it's uh, I'm not bashing um, Star Wars, but it's actually kind of loosely what um, George Lucas based the force concept on. He based it on Buddhist philosophy actually, but. Uh, this pantheism still exists in, in tons of ways. In ways that like some people believe, and it's not because they're tied to some religious organization or philosophical movement. It's just kind of, I don't know, people believe it. they like, well, you know, I believe that what will happen when you die? I'll just become one with the universe. You know, it'll be good. And maybe I'll come back as a tree or something. I literally had a conversation two weeks ago with somebody who said that. I was like, tree. That's cool. I don't know, man. Tree? And then they talked to me about how, yeah, I'm kind of done with the church. I mean, I went to church when I was a kid, but I just think this feels better. And I was like, man, how do you even minister to somebody that's that in such a different headspace? Folks, welcome to the world we live in. This is, these two groups actually probably represent the majority of people outside of the church. Now, they wouldn't call themselves Stoic or Epicurean, but either people have a tendency to veer towards kind of agnostic atheism, just we're, we're, we're worm food when we're done, or kind of a new age spirituality of we're just all energy floating out there and we'll just keep going in some form. How Paul answers these two groups is a guideline for how do we minister to the people around us that are in a very different headspace. We might want to say, okay, let's, let's go to Scripture and we'll show them all the places in Scripture where they're wrong. Here's, what's the problem with that? They don't believe this. This is no longer the, the, the baseline for belief in our society. I mean, arguably, I don't know that it ever was, but it, it certainly isn't now. And we can sit around and lament that. We can get angry and want to tear down idols. Or we can do what Paul did was say, I'm going to go where they are and talk to them. So he runs into these two groups. And both of these 
Paul's talk of Jesus hits both of these groups really kind of differently. Some of them accuse him of actually the, the some translations say babbler, but actually the, the word is, is uh, it's actually related to the word logos, actually. It's, uh, it's, it actually means picker of words or picker of seeds. It's a reference to a bird that will come along a path and like grab whatever it could, like, oh, you drop some food, grab whatever it can. And it meant someone who would kind of, it was used kind of metaphorically to talk about somebody who would be like, listen, it's like I was standing next to you while you're having a conversation, and I don't know really what you're talking about, but I'm going to just grab, like, oh, I heard you say that word, I'm going to grab that word and use it in my context again, kind of to, to build ground with you. And meanwhile, you're like, you don't even know what that word means, man. What are you doing? They kind of looked at him kind of oddly. And they don't say like, oh, what is this babbler talking about in a positive way? They're saying it kind of negatively. And others actually mistake him for speaking about these strange foreign gods. Two of them. Look at your text. It doesn't say talking about a foreign deity. It says talking about foreign deities, plural. Two of them. One named Jesus and the other one named Anastasia. Resurrection. They came, he comes preaching about Jesus and the resurrection, it says. It's the way Luke puts it. He says, um, they accused him of preaching foreign deities, Jesus and the resurrection. He's saying these are the name of the foreign deities. The Greek word for resurrection is Anastasia. We say it Anastasia. Why do we say it that way? Because it's a name. It was a name then too. It was actually a pretty common name. It was about as common as Jesus was among Jews. Pretty common. And they would have actually probably heard Paul talking about Jesus and his resurrection as this foreign god, Jesus, and I don't know, maybe his wife or his sister, this woman, Anastasia, because Anastasia is a female word. But they don't really understand what he's saying. And they took him, so the the, the philosophers here, they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus, saying, "May uh, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting, for you bring some strange ideas to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. By the way, this is, um, that last expression is a good example for those of you who um, listen to or were in class on Thursday night of hyperbole. This is Luke, like they didn't literally just sit around and talk about new ideas and never did anything else. He's saying, it seems like that's all they ever did around there. Like they did other things, but he was just kind of saying in a hyperbolic way, You know, they did this a lot. So because of Paul's willingness to go to a new place and preach in a different setting, he gets opportunity to preach to a different audience, which gives him a new opportunity to preach even more. As much as the philosophers questioned Paul's message, they actually wanted to hear more. Their response to Paul wasn't like, this guy's an idiot. They said, man, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm kind of interested. Let's, let's, let's hear what you have to say. And uh, they bring him to this place called the Areopagus. Remember how I said everything in Athens was like steeped in religion? Well, the Areopagus is actually literally Ares, or, or in, in Roman, Mars Hill. It is named for the Greek god of war, Ares. In Roman, it's... Mars. Some translations say Mars Hill. Um, so literally, they're like, hey, hey, you're talking about these, uh, these weird God things. And Paul, meanwhile, in the back is like, all these idols are driving me nuts. And they're like, let's bring you to this place called Ares Hill. <laughs> He's like, are you kidding me, man? All right, fine. It wasn't necessarily, a, it wasn't actually a temple to Ares, um, but it was named after Ares, and I'll tell you why in a second. It was actually used as a court and a place for public discourse. There's some debate about whether they were like, we're going to try Paul. It doesn't seem like that's what they're doing. It's more the public discourse. Like, hey, let's hear, let's give you a place where these are where people gather explicitly for the purpose of hearing new ideas and give you a shot to share your new idea. 
And so they bring him there. This is the Oropagus. You're like, wow, that seems weird. This is actually looking at it from the Parthenon, by the way. It's a view from the Parthenon looking down on the Oropagus. It is a large hill right near all of these temples. Um, back in the day, it would have had like kind of seating around the side. It would have been a little, a little flatter on the top, erosion and time and worn. Uh, but there were stairs that went up to it, and it was kind of a flat, open-air meeting spot. Um, it's called Mars Hill because in Greek mythology, um, Ares wasn't always a good guy. He was often naughty and did bad things, like killed people he shouldn't or stole things he shouldn't, did that kind of thing. And he actually killed, the story goes, some of the, um, the, the children of Poseidon, and he was put on trial on this hill in the city of Athens before it was Athens. And so they call it the Hill of Ares because it was where he was tried. And so they turned it into a court, a place to hold public trials. And eventually they also just had it as an open air place to share ideas. Still there, still go to it. So Paul is actually given an opportunity to preach Christ before the elite of the city and everyone else who would gather, who would, and, and, and Luke says it, people who wanted to come and hear ideas, they were open to it. Luke's comment about the curiosity of the Athenian people means that the crowd would be an audience willing to listen to what Paul had to say. They wanted to hear this. This is closer to the church in Berea's response. Remember the church in Berea, it says they received the word of God with all eagerness, and then it says that they searched the scriptures to see whether it's true. The difference is these people don't have the scriptures. They don't have any any Jewish background, they have no background at all in these things. So Paul is going to walk into a, an audience that he has very little common ground with. And he's going to present the gospel to them in a way that makes sense to them. He could have just been angry with them for not believing. But what good would that have done? Whose fault is it that they didn't know? Nobody had told them. Ironically, later on, Paul will write, how will they believe if no one preaches to them? And how will, they, um, and how will somebody preach to them unless they're sent? Paul took a step out and said, okay, I see, I see a culture and a people around me that are broken and they don't know God. And instead of being angry with them for it, Instead of trying to change all the cultural things, he said, meet them where they're at. And he took an opportunity and he started just going where he was, where, where that kind of thing was permitted and okay. And he started talking about stuff and people started listening. And they didn't understand it and they said, well, then, then let's give you an audience to make it clear to us. This opportunity came about because of his willingness to go to where they were. Not to just stay in the synagogue and hope they came to him. So here's our so what for this week. Paul's response to the sinfulness of the society around him led him to see their need for Jesus and preach the gospel to them. To put it succinctly, that's what happened. Do we do the same? Or do we just rail against society for not being Christian? His engagement gave him opportunity to share Jesus in new and greater ways. Are we willing to engage with others too and see what God does? When I was, uh, I was in high school, before I knew Christ, I had friends that knew Christ. And they made a point to reach out to me. And not, not explicitly to say, like, I am going to um, preach Jesus to you. Every time I see you, I'm just going to yell at you about Jesus until you believe or something. They became friends with me. They found common ground, things that we had in common that we both were interested, that we were all interested in, and they became my close friends. And so when they talked about Jesus, I wanted to listen to what they had to say. When they invited me to go to youth group with them, I wanted to go because that's where my friends were. 
And I listened to what was being said because I saw something different in them. They didn't treat me like a project. They didn't treat me like the enemy. But they did treat me like somebody who needed Jesus and that they would love. I'm passionate about this for a reason. I think I'm passionate about it first and foremost because God is passionate about this, but also because I wouldn't know Christ today if it wasn't for people doing what Paul did. I wouldn't. I grew up in the same society you guys did. A lot of similar opportunities to, to people who grew up in the church. I had some things that were different. I had parents who God wasn't a priority. By the way, if you talk to my parents about those Epicurean and Stoic things, my dad is definitely an Epicurean. My mom, probably closer to Stoic. Neither of them know Christ. Not for my lack of, not, for, not due to my lack of trying. But. This is our meditation verse for today. It's actually from Colossians. This is Paul speaking. He says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. That's what Paul did. Next week, we are going to look at exactly what he said to that group of people. How did he connect with them and make the gospel relevant to where they were? And, you'll, and we'll see it's very different than how he preaches to other people because they're different people. I'm going to ask uh, Jim to come up right now. He's going to lead us in a time of prayer. Lord, we come to you this morning thanking you for who you are, praising you for what you have done and revealed yourself in in so many ways in our lives. You have given us a hope that is beyond this world. And we come grateful to you for that hope that is within us. We thank you for the message that you have given us, the message of that love, the message of that care that you have for us. And we pray that as we interconnect with those around us, we may heed the lessons that you taught to us today to be able to make use of the opportunities that we have to present what you have done in this world and what you have done for us as individuals. We want to lift up to you several things of, that affect our lives. First of all, we want to thank you for your answered prayers for Sybil and the We are happy to see her here. We pray your continued healing in her life. We thank you for the testimony that she has been. We want to lift up our friend Jim Anderson. We don't understand why these things happen, and yet we can even see in this that you are using that as a testimony of your love and your care. It is our prayer that you heal. It is our prayer that you remove the problem of uh, both the the tumors that have developed and have been treated, and we pray for the strokes, that the effects of those might be minimized and just that he may continue to praise you in this situation. We also want to lift up our friend Orville as he is uh, experiencing the back pain. Lord, you are the great physician, and we, we just raise up our desire 
to see him restored to health and restored as they come back to minister amongst us. This week we want to lift up especially Mark and, and Glee Williams. Lord, you have called them to a, a very difficult area of uh, Papua New Guinea and, and into the uh, concentration of the Muslim faith. We just ask for their wisdom. We ask for uh, the safety as, as they go forward and may your love break through so many bar barriers that exist to their ministry. And then uh, as the world is in the turmoil that we see around us, we want to raise up especially those that from our congregation that are in, in the service. We thank you for Derek and his return but we pray for continued guidance in his life and future service that uh, you might be in everything that is done. Keep him spiritually safe, keep him physically from harm. And two, we want to lift up Ben uh, Hansen and we just pray especially for him as he is currently actively deployed that you too, you will also guide and protect him as he serves our country. And so we thank you for all the things that you have provided. We thank you for the hope that is within us. We thank you for the message that we heard today that we should approach, how we should approach those around us that have no hope in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and we'll close with Near the Cross.
Jesus, as we, as we go from this place today, fill us with your spirit, send us out um, to engage the world around us, not seeing those who don't know you as enemies, but instead those who desperately need you. We have a mission field all around us. Give us a heart for those who don't know you and patience with them as you are patient with us. Lord, we pray that as we are singing about drawing near to you, near to the cross, that we remember that the only reason we have any goodness in us, any right standing before you is not because we are good, but because you are good. And grace your grace is available to all. And help us to live in that truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day, guys.